Welcome to the NDSU FSA uh, webinar. Laura Heinrich from, from uh, the state FSA office will be doing a PowerPoint and, I'm, and I will be doing an example. Uh, I am Ron Haugen with the Extension Service uh, Farm Management Specialist. And we're gonna go over the ERP 2022, uh, uh, one aspect to it. The, the, uh, we're gonna kind of concentrate on the expected revenue portion of it. Uh, so welcome to the webinar. But with that, uh, I will let Laura take over. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. And thank you so much, Ron, Scott, and Miranda with NDSU um, Extension Service for assisting North Dakota Farm Service Agency getting information out on the ERP 2022 disaster program. So Congress allocated over $3.74 billion in assistance to agricultural producers impacted by qualifying natural disasters experienced during the calendar year 2022. Um, the Farm Service Agency, or FSA, is administering this emergency relief to eligible producers through, two, through a two-tracked process. Tract 1 leverages existing federal crop insurance or non-insured crop disaster assistance program, or NAP, data as the basis for calculating that initial payment. And Tract 2 is intended to fill additional assistance gaps and cover eligible producers through a revenue-based certification program. And as Ron said, um, today we're going to just briefly go over track one um, and track two. There is two options to apply for assistance, but we're going to focus more on the expected revenue. And I'll get into that um, in a few slides. So you'll notice when I talked about the 20, um, 2022 ERP that we talked about a qualifying natural disaster event. So to be eligible for 2022 ERP Track 1 and Track 2, um, you must have su suffered a qualifying disaster event um, in whole and or in part um, for a crop on your farm. So those qualifying disaster events include wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, derechos, excessive heat, winter storms, freeze, smoke, excessive moisture, qualifying drought, and related conditions. In regards to qualifying drought, uh, qualifying drought um, ERP 2022 assistance is available if any area within the county in which the loss occurred was rated by the U.S. Drought Monitor as level two or D2 for eight consecutive weeks or higher or D3 at any time um, during the calendar year. In North Dakota, we had about 31 count. We had 31 counties that were eligible um, under qualifying drought and a listing of those can be found on our national ERP website. And I will cover that at the end of the presentation. You can also reach out to your local FSA office and they can let you know if qualifying dr drought um, is one of the eligible qualifying disaster events in your county. So the first um, part we're gonna talk about is 2022 ERP track one, eligible crops and trees included in track one, are crops for which federal crop insurance or NAP coverage was available, and a crop insurance indemnity or NAP payment was received. Um, crops intended for grazing are not included in ERP Track 1 or Track 2. Producers were mailed a pre-filled ap uh, application in FSA 523 um, to producers whose crop insurance or NAP data was available on was available and on file because they received a crop insurance indemnity or NAP payment. Producers will need to return that completed FSA 523 to their FSA recording county office, along with additional eligibility forms, optional payment limitation and or increased benefit forms if those are not already on file. So those original FSA, pre, or FSA 523 applications were originally uh, mailed out from our Kansas City office on November 9th, 2023. And we will be doing um, an updated mailing for anyone who maybe had changes to their crop insurance or NAP data, or maybe weren't originally included in that initial mailing in November. And that should happen within the next couple of weeks. In regards to the eligibility forms that need to be filed, um, producers will need to file an AD or either file or have one on file already and AD 1026 for highly erodible um, and wetland conservation certification and a farm operating plan. 
in regards to the uh, optional payment limitation and or increased benefit forms, um, those forms would consist of the FSA 510, which is a request for exception of the $125,000 payment limitation and the CCC 860, which is for our under producer certification. The eligibility forms, the 1026 and farm operating plan uh, need to be filed within 60 days of the announced deadline, which we have not announced a deadline yet for track one or track two. And then the FSA 510 or that exception to the $125,000 payment limitation and the CCC 860, uh, the underserved producer certification, those will need to be filed um, by a deadline that we'll announce at a later date. So once you receive that application, um, you on the application, you'll also need to certify that the calculated RMA indemnity or NAP payment received was due in whole or, or in part to a crop production loss or tree loss caused by a qualifying disaster event or related condition occurring in calendar year 2022. And in the previous slide, we covered what those qualifying disaster events were. Um, the producer must also certify that they agree to purchase crop insurance or NAP coverage um, as applicable for the crop at a 6100 coverage level or higher for insured crops or at a basic 5055 catastrophic le level or higher for NAP crops. They must purchase that coverage for the next two available crop years and that linkage requirement must be met by um, the year 2027. So the application, um, the FSA 523, is in the name of the prim primary policy holder um, for crop insurance. And if that primary, primary policy holder had um, producers who had a substantial beneficial interest or an SBI interest in that crop, um, they will be listed on the application. Um, this primary policy holder will need to certify to the percentages um, of interest in the crop on that application also, and any of those SBIs, if they're designated to share, must also sign for it to be a completed application when received by the FSA office. Once we receive that application, um, we'll review it and payments will be calculated. The Estimated 2022 ERP or 2022 ERP estimated payment on the application um, are calculated by RMA and FSA data that's on file for both agencies at the time um, the application was ran. RMA and FSA will calculate each producer's loss consistent with the loss procedures for the type and level of coverage purchased but using the ERP 2022 program factor in lieu of a coverage level um, obtained by the producer. And we'll go through the program factors in the next slide. This calculated amount is then adjusted by a progressive payment factoring for RMA insured crops. Um, producers, underserved producers will have their share of the premiums and administrative fees added to the payment amount. So this slide just shows, um, based on the crop insurance level, what that ERP 2022 factor will be um, for both crop insurance and NAP coverage levels. So in the example, um, if you had a crop insurance policy at a 60% coverage level, we would bump up that production coverage level to 85% to calculate your estimated 2022 ERP track one payment. The estimated um, 2022 ERP track one payment will then be factored using a progressive uh, factoring and then also have a 75% payment factor applied to it. So as an example, um, if a producer had a $10,000 payment, their payment would be factored down to $6,000. So for the first $2,000, they're gonna get 100% of the pay of that amount from $2,001 to $4,000, they get 80% 80, 80 of that $2,000. So with that calculation, it comes out to about $6,000. And then that 75% payment factor is applied, which results in about a $4,500 payment. 
for anything over ten thousand dollars, that's paid out at an additional seven and a half percent. So that's that anything over ten thousand dollars is at ten percent, and then we factor that by the seventy five percent. The reasoning for the factor is that we had about eleven point seven billion dollars nationally of uncovered losses, and we only had three billion dollars that were allocated by Congress for the program. So if we would have just factored all payments the same, the payment factor would have been 27% instead of 75%. And nationally, 80% of the producers benefited from using this progressive payment factor um, instead of doing that flat payment factor of 27%. And in North Dakota, 78% of our producers benefited um, for, from using this progressive payment factor. And just so you know, we've issued a lot of payments under Track 1 already since those applications went out in November, um, and we've issued about $75.9 million so far. So now we're going to get into Track 2. So Track 2 is a revenue-based certification program that provides assistance for producers that suffered a loss in disaster year revenue as compared to the benchmark revenue that was due to necessary expenses associated with losses of eligible crops due in whole or in part to a qualifying disaster event that occurred in the 2022 calendar year. Again, we're ex excluding grazing crops um, when we look at uh, track two um, for eligible crops. If all or part of a loss was because of a qualifying disaster event or related condition, that entire loss is eligible under track two. So an example would be if a producer suffered a loss for his wheat crop in 2022 because of excessive moisture and hail, remember hail isn't um, a qualifying disaster event, if that uh, excessive moisture and hail ca caused a decrease in allowable gross revenue, um, they would be eligible for track two. However, even though um, part of that loss was due to hail, because they had the excessive moisture that caused a portion of the loss, the entire loss is eligible. Track two provides assistance for eligible revenue production and quality losses of eligible crops. Utilizing a producer's decrease in disaster revenue allows for the loss to reflect the producer's revenue regardless of whether the loss occurs before harvest or after harvest while the crop is in storage. There's two options um, for applying for Track 2. Producers can either select the tax year option or the expected revenue option. And today we're going to focus more on the expected revenue option. To just give you a quick overview of the tax year option, producers who choose the tax year option will select either 2018 or 2019 as their benchmark year, and then either their 2022 or 2023 um, as their representative revenue year for the disaster year. For those years, the producer will determine their allowable gross revenue based on the year for which the revenue would be reported for the purpose of filing a tax return. And the reason we're not going in depth on the tax year option is because in late March or early April, an ERP 2022 Track 2 webinar focusing on the tax year option will be conducted by a USDA tax group and will be posted to the taxes and USDA programs farmers.gov website. And we'll amplify that as soon as we get that recording out there. Um, we'll put it in our uh, state FSA newsletter or a bulletin and provide that information to county offices. So if you have any questions, we can get you that link and you can review it um, if you choose to apply under the tax year option. There are certain producers who are required to use the tax year option, and those are producers who receive payment under the previous ERP phase two for the 2021 disaster year and chose 2020, 2022 as their representative revenue year for 2021. Not sure if I said that right. I want to say that again. So producers who are required to do it are producers who receive payment under the previous ERP phase two for the 2021 disaster year and chose 2022 as a representative revenue year for 2021. Um, 
Right. That sounds confusing. Your county offices know which one, um, which producers uh, this is applicable to. And we only had a handful in North Dakota, so this really isn't widespread. So there's not a, a lot of producers who are required to take the tax year option. In North Dakota. So now we're going to get into the expected revenue option. So producers who choose uh, the expected revenue option will certify to their expected benchmark year revenue, which represents what the producer reasonably expected prior to the impact of a qualifying disaster event, and they'll also certify to their actual disaster year revenue. Uh, the certified expected and actual, actual values will include revenue from all eligible crops that could have been affected by a qualifying disaster event that occurred in calendar year 2022. Expected revenue must be based on realistic projections that can be supported by acceptable documentation of expected inventory, acres, yield, and unit price. And for actual disaster year revenue, will include revenue for all eligible crops that were included in the producer's expected revenue calculation. There are certain producers who are required to use the expected revenue option. Um, those producers are producers so use the expected uh, revenue option instead of the tax year option. And those are producers who did not have a revenue in 18 or 19. Um, those producers who experienced, experienced a decrease in their operation capacity during their disaster year as compared to their 2018 and 2019 benchmark years. And those producers who need to include the value of eligible crops produced but not sold that could have been affected by a qualifying disaster event that occurred in calendar year 2022. So these are gonna be um, crops that maybe were in storage, um, used in the operation like uh, wheat for seed, or crops that were fed to the producer's livestock, like maybe corn silage, corn for grain that was used for feed, um, or any like say native grass or GMA or alfalfa grass that was baled and fed to the producer's livestock. So those producers would be required to use the expected uh, revenue option for track two. Producers who had an increase in operation capacity um, may elect either to use the tax year or the expected revenue option. Um, producers who choose the tax year option and had an increase in operation capacity may not adjust their benchmark year revenue um, under the tax year option to reflect an increase. So more than likely, if you had an increase in your operation from 2018 and 2019 to 2022, you're more than likely going to want to use the expected revenue option because you can't, under the tax year option, increase your 18 or 19 benchmark year to reflect what you would have gotten based on the increases that you had um, in production capacity for 2022. So now we'll kind of get into the nuts and bolts um, with this expected revenue. <clears throat> so if you choose this option, the first thing you wanna do is determine um, what your eligible crops are that you need to include uh, for your benchmark year. So benchmark year revenue is the producer's expected revenue from all eligible crops that could have been affected by a qualifying disaster event in calendar year 2022. So those crops include prevented crops that were prevented from being planted, crops that were planted, including annual and perennial crops, inventory crops, and then crops that were in storage that could have been affected by a qualifying disaster event in calendar year 2022. Crops that could have been impacted by a 2022 qualifying, qualifying disaster event include crops planted in 2021 that could have been affected by a disaster event in 22, crops planted or prevented from being planted in 2022 that were affected by a disaster event in 2022, and 2023 crops that were planted in 2022 that could have been affected by a disaster event in 2022. So that was a lot of words. So to give you examples um, of the first bullet and the third bullet, so the first bullet would be, say you planted winter wheat in 2021, 
and it you know came back up in the spring and was affected by drought or um, excessive moisture in 2022. So that would be an example of a 2021 crop that was planted in, or a 2022 crop that was planted in 2021, but was affected by a calendar um, year event in 2022. <clears throat> the third bullet would be kind of just the opposite. So you'd have a 2023 winter wheat um, that was planted in the fall of 2022 that could have been affected by say drought in 2022. Um, even though it's a 2023 crop, it was planted in 2022 and was affected by a 2022 disaster event. So we would include that as part of our benchmark year revenue. Additionally, um, crops that uh, would could be impacted by a 2022 call qualifying disaster event are crops in storage that could have been affected by a qualifying disaster event in cal calendar year 2022. So the example there would be corn that was grown, harvested and placed in storage during calendar year 2021. And it remained in storage into calendar year 2022 and was then affected by flood damage that occurred in March of 2022. So because that 2021 crop was in storage during calendar year 2022 and was affected by a qualifying disaster event, it should be included as part of our benchmark um, year revenue. Perenni in addition, we'll also include perennial crops that could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event and then inventory crops that could have been affected by a disaster event in 2022. When we talk about inventory crops, we're talking about like aquaculture, floriculture, um, those type of, of crops <clears throat> where it's based on inventory, not necessarily acres. So once we've determined what our um, crops are that we need to include in our benchmark year, then we need to determine what our expected revenue was from them. So to calculate the benchmark year revenue, for perennial planted and prevent plant yield based crops, we'll take the producer's expected acres multiplied by their expected yield per acre multiplied by the expected price. So that'll be the uh, rev expected revenue for our benchmark for any yield based crops. For crops that are in storage, we'll take the producer's production that was in storage multiplied by an expected price. And then for inventory crops, we take the total inventory multiplied by the expected price. Benchmark year revenue must be based on realistic projections that can be supported by acceptable documentation of expected inventory, acres, yield, and unit price. And this slide lists a bunch of different options that producers can utilize. Um, to document or you use to determine what their expected benchmark uh, revenue is. So you may have a sales contract, a 2022 sales contract that you had um, for say corn at $6. You could utilize that uh, sales contract to determine that the quantity and price um, that you had contracted and the price that you had contracted for, that's what you utilize to determine what your benchmark, um, your revenue was for that quantity. You can also use crop insurance documents, which is probably the most simple. Um, if you had all your crops insured, you can use for your acres that would have your acres on there that would match your acreage reported FSA also. It would also have your APH, which would, which would be what your expected yield is. And then it would have the RMA price for the unit price that you could utilize as what your expected price would be. If you had a crop that you maybe didn't have insured and you're not sure um, what type of yield and price to use for a expected revenue, you can go out to their website, um, to the RMA website and find out for your county what the T yields are or the expected yield for that crop is in county and then also what the, the crop insurance price was. And you could utilize that to help determine what your expected revenue was. <clears throat> you can also use farm business plans. You have our FSA acreage report that you can utilize for your number of acres 
if you have a crop such as um, native grass and you need help establishing what the yields and prices would be for that, um, you can contact your local FSA office and they can look up what our tea yields are that we use for our NAP program and then also what prices. And then there's also NAS data or any information like that NDSU puts out for um, yields and prices. Any of the documentation that you utilize, um, you do need to keep for three years in case you're selected for spot check. Okay, so we've determined what our expected revenue um, is based on the crops that we determined um, could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event. So then for each one of those crops, we need to determine what our actual um, disaster year revenue was. So the disaster year revenue is the actual revenue from all crops included in the producer's expected revenue. And the revenue must include the following. So revenue of, from sales of those of that eligible crop, federal crop insurance indemnities and NAP payments for eligible crops, minus the premiums and fees, indemnities for eligible crops from private crop insurance policies. So that would be if you had like a private hail insurance policy, the value of eligible crops produced but not sold, such as crops in storage or inventory used in the operation or fed to producers livestock. So again, if you fed um, some of the hay that you included in your expected revenue, then you need to determine um, the quantity and price for the disaster year to include in your actual um, disaster year revenue. You'll also need to include any uh, 2022 calendar year disaster losses for eligible crops. So if you received any ARC County or ARC individual, note that it's not doesn't say PLC because that's a price decrease, right? So we're just looking at yield based. So if you received an ARC County or an ARC individual payment um, for 2022 ARC PLC, you'll want to include that. And then if you had any LDPs or market loss gains. You also want to include any net gains from hedging, any grants, um, or state programs for the direct loss of eligible crops or the loss of revenue for eligible crops. And then any other revenue directly related to the production of eligible crops that IRS requires the producer to report as income. And again, for your actual year revenue, you also need to include any or keep any of the documentation you used to uh, come up with that value for three years. To establish the value of crops in storage at the time of application, um, we have the, filing, the following guidance. For crops in storage that were produced in 2022 or 2023, the actual disaster year price may differ from the expected benchmark price because, the market, because of market price fluctuations between planting and the time of market. This can be attributed to market price fluctuations, quality, or production losses related to the qualifying events that occurred in the 2022 calendar year. Crops in storage from 2021 or earlier must use the expected price in calculating benchmark and actual disaster year revenue if the crops remain um, in storage at the time of application. So they have to use the same price for 2021 and earlier. So we'll go through an example. Farmer Joe grew 100 acres of corn, 100 acres of barley, and 1,000 acres of soybeans in 2022, and also had wheat from 2021 that was in storage in 2022. Farmer Joe suffered a qualifying loss on corn, soybeans, and 2021 wheat in storage, but did not suffer a loss on his barley. The expected disaster year revenue and actual disaster year revenue will be calculated for all crops, including the 2021 wheat, as it was in storage during 2022 and could have been impacted by a 2022 qualifying disaster event. 
Farmer Joe also certified that all eligible acreage of his eligible crops were covered by crop insurance or NAP. So the first thing we want to do is identify our crops that um, could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event. So in this example, we have the corn, soybeans, and barley that the producer, that Farmer Joe planted, and then the 50,000 bushels of 2021 wheat that was in storage that in 2022 that could have been affected by a 2022 qualifying disaster event. The next thing we need to do then is establish what our benchmark year revenue or our expected benchmark year revenue is. So for our yield based crops of corn, soybeans and barley, we're gonna take our acres times our expected bushels times our price to get our expected revenue. So the 100 acres times could have for corn, the producer could have used his APH of 200 bushels an acre times an RMA price of $5 to come up with $100,000 and do the same thing for the soybeans and barley. And then for the 50,000 um, bushels of 2021 wheat, the producer valued that at $6.50. So we total all four of those items up and the producer's total expected revenue is $1,179,000. The next thing we need to do then is determine what um, Farmer Joe's actual disaster year revenue is. And again, so we're gonna look at those crops that he included for his expected revenue, and we need to account for those under uh, the actual disaster year revenue. So we had the 100 acres of corn. So we have the revenue from the corn sales. So he sold some and received $25,000. And he still had 4,000 bushels stored that was quality affected of his 2022 corn. And so he took a sample of that, took it down to the elevator and they at the time of application and they said the value would be $3. So that's what he utilized and you'd wanna keep that documentation. So you take the 4,000 bushels times the $3 that gives you $12,000. Um, he sold all of his barley, so th that totaled 34,000. He sold all of his soybeans, which totaled 50,000. And then we get to the 2021 wheat that was in storage in 2022. So out of that 50,000 bushels, he sold 35,000 um, in 2022 or later. And the value of that was $270,000. He had 5,000 bushels of 2021 wheat that was still in storage at the time of application. And so he had to value that at $6 and 50 cents because that's what he used um, as his expected revenue price. <clears throat> so the 5,000 times the 650 gives you 32,500. And then the remaining 10,000 was destroyed by a flood. So the value of that is zero because it was destroyed. And then we also need to include, um, he received a soybean and corn crop insurance indemnity so we took that, subtracted off the premiums and fees, and that totaled 400000 So we total all that up, and the actual disaster year revenue is $823,500. $823, so based on that information, how do we calculate a payment? So we're going to take the producer's benchmark year revenue and multiply it by an ERP factor of 90% if all acres of all eligible crops were covered under federal crop insurance or NAP, or 70% if not all acres of all eligible crops were covered by federal crop insurance or NAP. So we'll take that amount, so the benchmark times the ERP factor, and then we'll subtract off the producer's um, disaster year revenue, and then subtract off the sum of the producer's gross ERP 2022 track one payments. So once we run through the calculation in the previous slide, we'll then apply the <clears throat> progressive payment factoring like we did to the track one payments. And then a 75% factor will also be applied uh, to the track two payments. Uh, for underserved producers, that progressive factored payment will be multiplied by a factor of 115%. So in the example we just went through, 
um, for Farmer Joe, we have his bench to calculate what his payment would be. We take our 1,179,000 benchmark revenue and we would multiply that by 90% because he insured all of his, his 2022 crops. And that equals our guarantee of 1,061,100. We subtract off our $823,500 for our disaster year revenue and Farmer Joe received $70,000 for ERP 2022 track one gross payment. So that results in a revenue loss of $167,600. So, and then that $167,600 will go through that prog progressive payment factoring and then apply the 75% payment factor. So how do we actually apply for track two? Producers will need to complete an FSA 524, which is the track two application and submit it to their recording county. On the 524, they'll certify to what their benchmark year revenue is and their disaster revenue. And then they also need to certify on the application the percentage of their disaster year revenue from specialty or high value crops. And those specialty high value crops are like um, dry edible beans, potatoes, uh, maybe soybean, food grain soybeans, organic crops. Those would be considered specialty or high value crops. And that percentage is certified on the application must be equal to the percentages that the producer would have reasonably expected to receive from a specialty or high value crop. Um, for the disaster year if there was not a qualifying disaster event that affected the crop. Producers, um, in addition to the FSA 524, must also submit an FSA 525, which is the crop insurance and or NAP coverage agreement. And this is similar to our track one. Um, they're just agreeing to the buy-up coverage for two years. They'll also need to submit any additional eligibility forms um, within 60 days of the program deadline and any optional payment limitation and or increased benefit forms um, by the deadline that FSA announced at a later date if those are not file already. There are some worksheets that are available to assist producers in determining their benchmark and um, actual year revenues. There's the FSA 524A worksheet, which is for the tax year option, and then the FSA 524B worksheet, which is for the expected revenue option. And Ron's gonna cover that FSA 524B um, in a little bit and go through an, a more real life example. Uh, there is a, an Excel automation tool that's available, and Ron will utilize that and give you um, an example on how to enter information into the tool. This is a screen print of our uh, National FSA ERP website, and down on the bottom right is where that ERP 2020 tool, 2022 tool is um, you have to scroll down a little bit, but it is on there. Um, and then it also has um, links to all the applications um, and any of the instructions for completing any of the forms. If you need any addi additional information on ERP 2022 track one or track two, you can contact your local FSA office um, or you can visit our national FSA website. Um, and it, just as a reminder, at this time, we don't have a deadline for track one or track two. Um, and so you'll want to be watching any uh, newsletters or information received from your local offices to know when that deadline is announced. And here's my contact information. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me. And with that, I will turn it over to Ron and he'll go through an example. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna open up that that uh, tool that Laura showed uh, that you need to click on on the bottom. 
I'm going to be going back and forth a little bit here. So I just wanted to uh, just wanted to um, uh, uh, show you how to how to enter some things as a as kind of a real life example. So when you when you load this, you got to have Excel on your computer, and it'll ask you uh, uh, to enable macros because these little blocks go from page to page, and that and that's what they call macros. Some computers are set so that they do not allow macros, and you would have to go to your settings and allow them to run this worksheet if you wanted to use these macros, just, to, just for your own information. So it's pretty easy to fill out this information. On the first, on the first line here, I'm just going to type in Joe Farmer. I won't bother putting in uh, 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 the, the phone numbers and things, but I'll just put, a, put an address in here. And let's just say it's Fargo, North Dakota. And then you do have some drop down uh, drop down arrows here. So for example, the recording state will pick will pick North Dakota. And then for the county, we'll pick Cass County. Whoops. Wrong county. There we go. Now, question 12 says, which benchmark year, 18 or 19, a tax year, will you, will, or will you use the expected revenue? So in this block here, we have a choice. If you're using the tax year method, you pick a year, but we're just going to demonstrate the expected revenue option. So we're going to click the bottom one. And you can see when you click that, it automatically pops in uh, the representative uh, revenue year as the actual revenue. Okay, uh, you had the choice. Uh, that's the only choice you have if you have expected revenue. So that fills out automatically. Question fourteen. Question fifteen. Were all eligible crops covered by crop insurance or NAP? You've so if they aren't all covered, you click no. If they all are covered, you click yes. Next question, 15. What percentage of expected revenue is from specialty or high-valued crops? Okay, you put in a percentage here, and I'm going to put in zero. So what that means is that you do not, in this simple example, that you do not have any specialty crops, such as potatoes, or 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 probably some some uh, food grade soybeans. Um, uh, all of your crops are considered non specialty uh, crops. When you do when you do this, um, when you do the expected revenue option, it automatically fills in line sixteen A, B, C, and D, and puts no. You don't have to worry worry about that um, at all. Okay. So the next thing, it's a little confusing here where to go next. You would think you'd probably want to keep going right down the spreadsheet. But the next thing you do, you want to go to, to this blue block where it says go to expected revenue sheet. And you click on that. And then you say, well, now what do I do? What, what do I put in there? Um, I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to bring up another um, sheet here to show you. I can find it. There it is. What information should we put on that sheet? Okay. So this is a typical crop insurance schedule of insurance. And as Laura mentioned before, you can use this information. So here's your APH, which is a, which is a good thing for a yield, your acres, of course, and then you've got your crop insurance price. Just wanted to show you where you could pluck numbers off your crop insurance sheet and as she mentioned, there's a lot of other sources that you can use to come up with the, this information. And then I'm going to go back to that other one again. So what are we going to enter in here? Let's just say that here is what I expected to get. Pretend we have two units of corn and, two un and one unit of soybeans. So I'm going to just type in corn. And let's say this first unit is 200 acres. 
And let's say based on our APH, it was 200 bushels an acre. And we need to type in bushels. And then based, let's just put in that crop insurance price. This is back in 2022 when the corn prices were very good. So oh, we'll put in five, uh, 590. Okay. Let's say in this other unit of corn, type in corn. So let's say that's 200 acres. Uh, let's say the yield was, this unit isn't quite as, as, uh, as profitable. It's only got 180 bushel yield uh, average. We'll put a, we'll put a hundred uh, bushels and we'll put the same price 590. Then let's use, so have soybeans here. I could spell and say that's 200 acres and we'll say our average yield is APH is 40 bushels and then the actually the crop insurance price is pretty high there as well uh 1433 that was the crop insurance uh, uh, uh price back in uh 2022 so all that no all, all this revenue added together is your expected revenue now let's pop back to the data entry area Okay, we've got that done. Then we go to line 17, actual revenue. Now, here, is a, it's a little tricky. It just wants you to put that in. So you're gonna have to do some side calculations here. So I'm gonna go and show you another sheet here. What are we gonna put in here? This is your actual revenue on your disaster year of what you actually got, not what you expected. Unit one, let's just say we had a couple assembly sheets, 12 loads, 12,000 bushels, 550. Uh, let's say we have another assembly sheet for this unit showing 10 loads, uh, 8,500 bushels at 540. The total revenue for that unit is 20,500 bushels uh, netting 111,900. We actually only got 102 and a half bushels compared to a, a 20 bushel average. So that was quite a loss on that unit. Now, unit two, let's say we combine some corn and got 9,000 bushels. We sold it for 530. And let's say we had a delay and later on we combined some more. That got on a separate assembly sheet. Uh, let's say there's 11 loads, 10,500, sold it for $5 a bushel. The total income for that unit is $100,000 and $100,200, 19,500 bushels. You netted 97 and a half bushels an acre when the actual what uh, average for that unit was uh, 180. So let's say we also combine our soybeans in unit one of soybeans. We had 10 loads, 8,500 bushels, sold it at $13. Uh, we netted 110,500. We actually got 42 and a half bushels an acre for where our average, as I mentioned, was 40. So um, we're above we're above average here. We did not get a loss on these soybeans, but you still need to include this in your income. So all this added together, the two units of corn and the unit of, so of soybeans equals 322,600. Let's remember that number, 322,600. Now I'll get back to that other sheet again. And so in this actual revenue, we type in 322,600. Okay, that's what we actually got. The next question, line 18, enter the amount of, uh, enter the, the total value of eligible crops that were, that were not sold. Okay, what this is, this would be, let's say you kept some grain for feed for livestock. Um, and that would be and that would be crop that's not sold. For this example, we'll just put in zero. The next question, 19. Enter the amount of, of total value of eligible crops that are in storage. Okay. What that means is that th this is grain that you have not yet sold. It could be in your own physical storage or could be at the elevator. For purposes of this example, we, we pretended up here on on line 17 that we sold everything. So now we're just gonna put in a zero. Question 20, enter the amount of eligible crops that remain in inventory. 
This is something we don't have to worry about too much. As Laura mentioned, this is kind of for nursery crops and other specialty type crops. We don't have to worry about that. Not too much of that in North Dakota. Okay, if I can get my screen adjusted here. Line 21, enter the amount of revenue from federal insurance proceeds on the eligible crops, less the, the fees and premiums. So let's say we did collect some crop insurance on this loss, and after subtracting the, the administrative fees and the premiums, let's say it ended up to be $40,000, okay? Next question, enter the amount of total revenue from NAP payments. Let's say we don't have NAP, so we're just gonna put in a zero. Next question, enter the amount of total revenue from private insurance. And what does private insurance mean? Probably hail insurance would be a good example. So if you did collect some hail insurance on this, in addition to the other losses, you need to put in zero. I mean, you need to put in the amount, I should say. But for our purposes, we're going to put in a zero. Now, remember what Laura said, that hail is not an in, 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 in eligible disaster. Okay, but you still need to include any hail proceeds. As Laura mentioned also, you need to include any government payments that are listed here, ARC County or ARC IC, but you do not have to include any PLC payments. So for, for let's just assume we're gonna have zero because back in 2022, there was not many payments paid out. Okay, so basically that is the form that you filled out. Then I'm going to go look at the FSA 524, as Laura had already talked about. I'm going to shrink that up a little bit here. So this is the FSA form already filled out. You can see it's got your name and your address in there. And basically, FSA wants two numbers from you. You notice that we, we click the expected, and we're expecting $563,000 in revenue but we only got 362,000, the actual. Those are numbers that we entered. These are the only numbers that you really need to, to, to give to FSA and let them do their thing on figuring out how much they owe you, okay? And you need to sign that and send it in. Also, part of this is the, the 524A, that's for the tax option, but we're looking at the 524B, which is for the uh, expected revenue option. And you can see these are the expected revenue that we've entered in here. The two units of corn, uh, it's totaled up here to 563,000 expected income. Uh, these other things are zeros that we've entered. It to all totals to 563. Um, on our actual, we had the, the 322,600, but we need to add that crop insurance that we collected. So it ended up to be 362,600. And this is the 524B. That is an addendum to the 524. So it's all filled out for you by doing that worksheet. It's kind of a handy tool. So with that, did I miss anything, Laura? I think we'll, we'll uh, stop sharing and, and entertain some questions. So that first question was, if we have multiple recording counties, do we submit an application to both or just one? So you're only gonna submit one application to the recording county. It's confusing. Producers ha may have more than one administrative county, but they really only have one recording county. And that recording county um, is the county where they generally submit their eligibility forms. So their farm operating plan, their 1026, um, that's their recording county. And they can contact any, they can submit it to any local FSA office and they will, that if that local FSA office is not their recording county, they'll go ahead and, and submit it to the, the proper county to process the application. But you are only gonna do one application to one county. The next question is, does it matter the year in which you sold the 2022 crop? And it does not. If you sold the crop prior to the time of application, you're going to use the revenue from the crop that was sold. 
So you're going to use that assembly sheet to determine what the value of that crop was. And I believe that answers the next question of line 19. Does that mean in storage right. at the end of the calendar year 2022 or at the time of application? So that would be um, in storage at the time of application. The question was, is line 17, is that the 2022 crop sold in 2022? It can be sold at, any, at 2023 as well. It's a 20, anytime the 2022 crop is sold is what you report, right? Right. Um, what did lines 11 through 14 include under adjustments? Can you pull it up again, Ron? Is that is that the part that's for the tax, your option? Lines 11 through 14. Oh, there's, there's where you can enter stored crops. Um, there's a question about the recording, and yes, there we will... Um, this is being recorded and it'll be posted on the NDSU website um, along with we will provide that link in our um, Farm Service Agency state newsletter and, and bulletins and our local county offices will have the link available to that they can provide uh, to producers. For large farms, do we have breakdown must, must be, do we have to break down expected revenue by section unit or can we take total dollar, total pounds of, total number of acres of that crop multiplied by their simple average? So example, a thousand corn acres, you, you can, yes, you can, if you know that, that 185 is your APH over all of your acres, you can, you don't have to do it by individual unit um, on that on the the worksheet. So I know like on our farm, we have our individual crop units still show we have um, enterprise units. So it does total it up and give us what our average is for our enterprise unit also. But um, you can do it either way. I guess one question here does prevent plant corn acres count to unexpected revenue, yes, it does, right? Correct, yes, it does. And then your revenue is gonna be zero right. for your actual disaster year revenue. And then it says, assume we need to apply, oh, that moved here, assume we need to, need to apply the share percentage on expected revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Ron, there, is there a share percent? There's a is there a share percentage on there? No, I didn't really. I didn't see that actually. I'm, if I did, I missed it. I think you're going to have to do a side calculation for that share. I think so too. And and I think Rob, you must be referring to more like maybe a husband and wife, where there's really only one assembly sheet. Otherwise. You know, if you're if you were two brothers farming together and you didn't sell your crop jointly, you're gonna have each each brother is gonna have their own um, assembly sheets and know what their um, revenue is. No, I don't see any share percentages anywhere on here. Hmm. So yeah, like Ron said, that would have to be a side calculation. That's a good question. Is there a deadline to submit, submit forms? No, there is not. Um, that We haven't announced one at this time. So just make sure you're watching our state um, and county newsletters to see uh, when that deadline is. So I think we covered the questions in the chat. Now we can go to the Q&A box. Okay. So the question is on line 19, as of what date slash time of application? So it's going to be at, at, at the time you file the, the 2022 ERP tract to application. So that would be if you're going to file it next week, then it's as of next week. When you file it, what crops are still in, what, 20, what crops that were um, could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event were still in storage. And then the question was, 
do you include deferred 2021 crop insurance for the 2022 actual revenue? No, you wouldn't. That's that's more of a tax year yep. um, option question. Um, under the expected revenue option, you're going to use the crop insurance um, payment minus the premium and fees for your 2022 crops that you listed as part of your um, expected benchmark revenue. And then the question on for box 17 there for the uh, for the uh, the total amount um, of revenue or, or I mean of actual revenue um, use the actual 2022 crop regardless of what yeah we I guess we've already answered that uh, regardless of what year it sold right so you're including any revenue from the crops that you included on your expected benchmark revenue. So the, the next part of that question is, do you ignore a carrying crop from 2021 or my choice? If that crop was in storage and could have been affected by a 2021 or 2022 calendar year disaster event, you would include that. And you need to account for that in your expected revenue and then account for when it was sold under your actual revenue. And then here, Chris is saying they, they did not receive a FSA 523 last November. Um, if you received a crop insurance indemnity, um, for your 2022 crop and did not get an FSA 523 mailed to you. Um, if you want to wait for a couple weeks, um, because we are um, going to mail out any, um, we're just getting a new updated data uh, for, for our track one uh, information. And so we will be mailing out any additional applications. But if you don't receive an FSA 523 and you received a crop insurance indemnity or a NAP payment, you need to contact your local FSA office. Then the question is: Does a drought map does does the drought map use primary and contiguous qualifications to allow other counties to qualify? It uses primary. Okay. Ah, eligible crops for this program. Is there a listing of eligible crops somewhere? And then for the for the ER. For the the for the ERP tool, do we include edible beans? It's all crops that could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event. So there's really not a listing of crops that are eligible, if that makes sense. Right. And then the other question was, if they had dry beans, do we do you include that in the actual revenue? Yes. I mean, for edible beans, yes, you're going to include them um, as part of the track two um, eligible crops. But when you go into your, when you do that percentage of uh, affected or percentage of, uh, you want to scroll up, Ron? Oh, oh, right there. Okay. the percentage from specialty or high value crops, that's yeah. where your dry edible beans will be part of that percentage. So if yeah. you had edible beans, you shouldn't have a zero there. You would have the yeah. percentage. The, this box 15, you're going to have to, whatever percentage of, of your of your acres are dry edible beans, you need to adjust that percentage in line 15. Uh, can, uh, is soybean seed production considered high value? Um, that one I would have to look into. That's a good question. Yeah. If you want to submit that question to you, um, me through email, I can answer you. Uh, should I just read? Should I just read this one to you? Uh, if sure. you add, if you add acres from eighteen or nineteen tax year versus twenty twenty two or twenty twenty three tax year. What prices and yield do you use for adjustments? Okay, so with this question, 
I'm going to make an assumption here. So we're we're going to apply under the expected revenue option. So 18 or 19 doesn't matter at all. No. Or do you think they're asking about? I think they're the asking about the tax year method. I think. And there you just go off your and off your uh, off your revenue from your tax. And you return, can't right? adjust. I mean, unless they were one of the producers who are required to use the tax year option, there is no adjustment of the of the benchmark or of the benchmark 18 or 19 years. That's what I was that was in one of my slides. So if that producer had an increase um, to their operation from 2018 to 2020 or to 2022, then they should be using the expected revenue option. Right. Um, one other question here, just to confirm, we have do we have to use the same estimated market price for unsold inventory at the end of the year for 18, 19, and 2022? Again, the 18 and 19 yeah, is not apply. Yeah. Right. That's not really applicable to the expected revenue option. The 18 and 19 benchmark year, that is a tax year option. So if you have 2018 or 2019 crop that's still in the bin in 2022 that could have been affected by a 2022 disaster event, then you would need to use, and it was still in the bin at the time of application, you would use the same um expected benchmark revenue price as you do for the actual revenue price and does 2023 prevent plant qualify as a cause of loss that occurred in 2022 I would like to see an example of what they're asking there. And, and if we're talking about track one or track two. Maybe they could submit that by email too. Yes. So if you're eligible for the 2022 ERP program, you should have received from FSA in November, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, you should get, you, uh, like Laura one. kind of already answered that one. Yep. So if you had prevent plant on your farm, every acre counts in this program, including prevent plant. Yes, right. You you're, so you're gonna do when we went through um the slides, when you're determining what your uh crops that you need to include as part of your expected revenue. You need to look at any 2022 crops that were planted or prevented from being planted. So you'll include those as part of your benchmark um, expected revenue. And then any proceeds you receive from the crop that you planted and sold, you're going to include that revenue as part of your actual year revenue. we got two more questions and then we better wrap it up here. Um, so do you include SCO and ECO payments that were paid out for the 2022 year, but were not received until 2023? So yes, you would. It doesn't matter when you receive that crop insurance payment for the 2022 crop. So if you, the 2022 um, crop year, you insured the crop, you had SCO, and that payment for that 2022 crop was paid, the SEO payment was paid out in 2023, you should include that payment as part of your actual um, year revenue. Okay, last one. So if, so if some of the wheat was affected by a disaster, then it's all, then, then all is eligible to be included. Does that include 2021 wheat in, in storage unsold still in 2022, even if the stored wheat wasn't affected by the disaster itself? So if 2021 wheat was in storage and could have been affected by a eligible disaster event, then they it would be included in the application. 
if we did miss some of your questions, just please submit them by email and we'll try to get them answered. Um, with that, we better we better cut it off and we appreciate you joining today. We appreciate Laura with all her expertise on, from FSA and um, and thanks Scott, our IT guy for hanging in there. So with that, I think we're ready to go. Any final thoughts, Laura? No, I just want to send out a big thank you to you and Scott and Miranda for getting information out on the webinar from the NDSU side and working with us to put this together. We very much appreciate it. So with that, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.